women's initial attraction is multi-layered. They're not just looking for looks, mm. availability. They're looking for how does he make me feel? Mm. Very important. How does he make me feel? How does he operate the room? Mm. How does he handle himself as a man? How does he handle me? Mm. What's his body like? So many things. So wow. when men say women are too fussy for their own good, well, they're hardwired. Mm. So this could be a woman who you could look at and say, well, what right does she have to be fussy? I mean, she she looks like this or she's this age. Yeah. But that's, that's not getting it. They're hardwired. Mm. They could be 60 years old and they'll still have this very, very set kind of ideas of what they want from their ideal man. Whereas a man, all a woman really has to do is look nice in a picture and he's, you know, that's it. She doesn't need to make some special comment about mm. a photograph. Yeah. Man has to. And I think a lot of men get frustrated like like that about that. They think well, it should be an equal playing field, but it's not. But it's not. It's not. And there's no point in sulking about it, crying about it, bitching about it. Just play the game. So, Kezia, let's... Uh... Let's dive in. Mm -hmm. Let's jump straight in. We're very informal here at TCM and at the Coaching Masters podcast. So, you know, let's just start from here. And of course, there will be, I'm going to I'm gonna pre-record an introduction for you as well. But let's just roll with this. Now, I always start in, in one particular place. Now, of course, we're going to dive into what it is you do. We're going to dive into your speciality, your niche. We're going to dive into the value that you add to your, to your clients and, of course, your students as well. But what I would love for you to do is I'd love for you to start at the beginning and you can interpret that in any way that you want. Start at the beginning. Uh, the beginning, it was 2006. Um, how many years ago is that now? Almost 20 years ago. That's quite yes, funny. it is. 17 years ago. Long time ago. And uh, I was in a bar um, and a man approached me and he said, that he ran uh, boot camps, workshops uh, that specialized in helping men to improve their uh, success rate with women, like mm. how they approached women, how they spoke to women. And would I be interested in being uh, sort of like one of the girls that they get to practice their lines on? Okay. They called it then the hot babe section. <laughs> <laughs> so I was intrigued for two reasons, you know, obviously, I wanted to see if, if this stuff really, really worked, you mm. know, because I was a cynic. I said, sorry, you know, attraction's there. It's not, you can't force it. Mm. And, you know, it just sounded like, what, what's, a, what's a pickup artist? What is this? Mm. You know, it was like a, a kind of new world. And I said, okay, I'll go. And I went there and there were two things that I noticed by the end of the workshop. The first was I was convinced. I, I mean, I just converted on the spot. You know, I was like, there are actual systems mm. and methods and techniques that can take a guy uh, with very basic skills with yeah. women and make him much more attractive, like a much mm. more appealing version of himself. Mm. I, found that, I found that really interesting. Yeah. And the second thing I noticed is that the other girls that were there weren't giving what I considered to be that honest feedback and advice that these men had paid for. Mm. So, I'm very direct, very to the point. I speak my mind. It's got me into a lot of trouble bef before. Yeah. But in this case, I thought it was going to get me into trouble again. And I just remember like getting my coat and thinking they're, go they're going to come after me with pitchforks, these guys. And actually they were like, can I book you for a private session, Kezia? I was like, of course not. You know, I'm just here today to do this. Yeah. But then the man who ran the company, because the one who I met, he actually worked for, he wasn't the boss. Yeah. He came to me and said, look, we need this. Men are looking for an honest female uh, opinion, mm. not something that just sounds nice, like be yourself, smile. Yeah, yeah. And they want to get a real direct insight into the female mind. So I just was like, okay, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, and I started learning a lot more about social dynamics, uh, you know, the art of building attraction. Mm. I... It was, it's very similar to sales mm. and marketing. Yeah. And I found that really fascinating. So what mm. happened is um, my reputation started to grow. I was really good at what I did. And I started up a YouTube channel on the mm. side. When was this? To, my first video I put out was, I think, 2008. Oh, wow. So, I mean, this was quite early as well it in YouTube. It could have been 2009, so I need to double check that. Mm. But it was around that time. 
And my first video was just so funny. It looks like <laughs> Acorn Antiques or something. <laughs> like you can see me at the beginning, so like stopping and starting. Like, is it on? Is it on yeah. the camera? <laughs> Brilliant. Oh my gosh. Um, so I did this and the boss wasn't happy. He was like, well, you know, it's not under the company name. And Okay. But I was under contract, mm. so I, I continued with it. And then something funny happened. Mm. The YouTube channel, which was like some side thing. I, did, I wasn't really even concentrating on it. it grew mm. and grew and wow. grew. And then I was contacted by a publishing company called Penance uh, Books. And they said, we'd love you to write a, a book. And it's going to be called The Noble Art of Seducing Women. And I'm, yeah. Not my choice. <laughs> so tacky. But so I said, OK, fine, I'll, I'll write the book. And I left the comp. So I left the company just as I got the book deal because I knew that I wanted all the media attention that would come with the release of that book yeah. to go on to m me and my new company because I was starting a new company. I was doing all these things at once, writing a book, mm. YouTube channel, started my company mm -hmm. and releasing a product. It was DVDs back then, so that was 2010. 2010, okay. Yeah, I was gonna say sort of roughly when this was, because this happened in 2006, didn't it? The initial experience. Yeah. So I was with them from, you know, seven, I mean, it was end of 2006. So let's say seven, eight, nine. So four years I was working with them, mm. yeah. Uh, what, what was going in your, on in your life Prior to 2006, I'd love to know a little bit more about mm. about the your background prior to that. Left school at 15. Yep. <laughs> didn't go to university. Didn't go to well. You can't if you leave if you leave school at 15. Um, didn't go to college. Yeah. Bummed around. Bummed around. Bummed around. Hung out with inappropriate men, boys. Yeah. Um, just you know, lost. Mm. And I loved it. I liked being you know waking up at one in the afternoon. <laughs> came from a very comfortable background, liberal yeah. parents that didn't really push me or motivate me, you know, yeah. wrapped up in their own crap, I would say. Mm. That, those kind of parents. Yeah. Well, that's just Kezia. You know, that's <laughs> just Kezia. It's fine. Yeah. Um, and then I started getting into the music industry. That was a funny one. I just start, started writing music and then I actually got an album deal, which was like, I can't sing a note, which is very funny. <laughs> I got an album deal and and I'm... Um, just odd jobs, you know, mm. working for the family business, doing this, doing that. So I was a waif. And then suddenly this guy comes along and completely changes my life. It's interesting, isn't it? I, I often I talk been about- in that bar that night at that time. Exactly. You know, I talk about the golf ball analogy, how, you know, if you hit a golf ball head on, it ends up over here. But all you need to do is hit it very so slightly to the left or to the right. And after it travels 100 yards, it's in a totally different place. That event in 2006, it was one of those golf ball events. You just had to be in that place at that time to experience that event. And now, of course, your entire life has unfolded in it's such funny, a way. It's even funnier than that. So yeah, the one thing, even even though I painted like quite a unappealing, um, non-inspirational picture of my life before this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was still, I wasn't like, I was quite, I, I was quite sharp. Mm. Um, I was one of those ones who could do very well at school if I put my mind to it. That's why the teachers were very frustrated. Mm. But I chose kind of like mucking about and stuff. But I was very like, very quick, very sharp all the time. And I was an opportunist. Mm. I believed that you always, said yes to things yeah um so with this it was quite funny because i i agreed to this guy and he'd given me in those days he gave me his email and i'd lost his email address so i said his name is this is his is it beginning with a k or c and i had to send three attempts that kept bouncing back i was like one last attempt let's do it and yeah so it was you know one of those Le these little things it's these tiny things isn't it in that case it's the difference between one letter mm -hmm. and your entire life could have unfolded in such a, a drastically different way what, what do you think you would be doing if that event had never happened and you'd never got into this particular field um i know what i've been doing i've been carrying on with the music i was seeing a guy at the time um and i ended up marrying that guy divorcing him also mm -hmm. um, but we did get married eventually i think i would have just ended up doing the music on the side uh Mm. Again, I'm an opportunist. So if something was to come along, mm. Mm. I am that kind of person that just says, mm. effort, you know, let's do this. Jump let's see what it. happens. What have you got to lose? Imperfect action. Just take action. Don't wait for it to be perfect. Just do it. Just say yes. I get very frustrated with people who say no. And not no because they think that's a bad idea, but just mm. no because they think they, they can't do it. Mm. Like, okay, let's cross that bridge when we get to it. Yeah. Say like, yes and then we'll cross that bridge. Yeah. Mm, always say, yeah, I can do it. I can do it. And go. And as soon as you go in there with that mindset, like, I can do this. I've always been that. I can do this. Yeah. And sometimes I can't. But when you wing it, 
you you can do better than you think. Definitely. So, okay, tell me, tell me and the listeners in your own words, what exactly is it that you are an expert in, that you specialize in? Tell me a bit about your expertise. Um, my expertise are in helping men to build attraction and, and with their dating skills. Mm. Um, but I'm also, because of that, I, I'm an expert on marketing. Mm. And um, I even released a book called The Irresistible Option a few months ago, which did really well. It shows how if you can apply certain rules of seduction and attraction building, it can help increase your sales. Wow. You, you actually can implement it into your marketing. That is interesting. Now, of course, as a business owner, I'm always interested in different marketing approaches. And even though I'm not, I don't know about this yet and I want to learn more from you, just on a, as a high level, I could see why. I could really see why this is effective. I think someone said something to me once about when writing copy, try to use very sensual words or physical words or things that will really resonate with people on a kind of vibrant level. Visceral, yeah. Visceral yeah. level, yeah. exactly. You know, and that yeah. makes well, a lot of sense to me. There's 10 principles that I've got in there and that's one of them. So it's about appealing to the, um, so you've got appealing to the rational um, mind and then you've got uh, appealing to the emotional mind mind so it's it's tapping into her what we call it mm. seduction tapping into her emotional realm mm. um so there's certain things that you can sell and you have to tap into the the rational buying motive so car insurance yeah you're looking at price that's rational sure you know uh, size of things uh, affordability time that's all rational but yeah. then you want to sell something else you've got to go for the the emotional pull mm. and You've got, uh, you've got the pain and pleasure principle. So you know it's yeah. it's very similar to how a person would build attraction. Mm. I always say, you know, attraction isn't rational. Mm. You can't you can't? And, and and we've all been there. We've all been with somebody who we've wanted back. For instance, you know, they ended it with us. And and the first thing that we do is we try and use logical persuasion and it never works. Mm, it never works. Interesting. You know, we've been together for a long time. Uh, you know, we're really good for each other. You know, we try and do that. We try and convince them with logic yeah. and it never works. You need to tap into the emotion. And there's a lot of people out there who got an idea to buy something, but you can't sell it because you just haven't, you're still on the rational. You're not focusing on, and that's when you use as you mentioned, certain words mm. to trigger to trigger that that feeling, and it can be based on the pain principle, fear mm. of missing out, fear of um, you know what life would be like if you didn't lose weight, if mm. you didn't get a handle of this. But also, you can use it for the pleasure principle, which is you know what life would be like if you you did lose weight. Wow. Yeah. See, this is really fascinating because I think for myself personally, I understand this so much on the level of marketing and I'd love to know a little bit more about that on the level of dating and the, and the level of attraction. So I'm kind of flipping it in my head because of course your new book is about taking those principles of dating and applying it to marketing. If we could kind of flip that and me and you talk some about some of the key attributes of marketing, how, how do they apply to dating? Let's take, for instance, like visceral language as, as one. That was one that just really stood out to me where I thought, wow, I understand that. Start using some visceral language in the copy that you write and have people feel things through that. How does visceral language apply to the, the dating world? Uh, so uh, the only thing that I'd say is different between um, the dating uh, principles of like attraction is that a lot of it is the physicality, you know, your body language and and your eye contact. Mm. So there are certain words that you can use, there are trigger words that you can use to, it doesn't work in the exact same way, but you can sort of um, arouse somebody's mm. desire for you. But it's a little bit more how you use your body language, yeah. how you deliver something, how you say something. Um, when you're trying to build attraction, whereas marketing is it's purely just just word based. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, that's so true, isn't it? Because of course that initial bit of marketing is often written and read. That is that's very well. I was going to say it's really going to be the case for dating, but I I kind of 
I, pre pre date. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but me and my wife have been together for fourteen years. Oh, congratulations! Thank you, thank you. And like we met very young. You know, we met really well. We worked in a gym together, and uh, I was only nineteen when I first got together with my wife, and we, we've been together ever since. But I suppose now with dating apps and online dating, I suppose the written words is quite important, I guess. Now, I, I was about to say, you know, in marketing, there's the written word that people are initially attracted to, but you wouldn't get that in the dating space. But I suppose, would you? Is that, as in, is that important on any level in terms of your ability to be able to write in a way that is, is going to attract the other person to you? Because that's now a form of initial contact. Like texting. You know, like texting, yeah, like the initial DM on texting, something like yeah, Tinder. Yeah, I understand. Um, Yes, but not as much as um, it's. It's not so much words. It's more about overall. What are you saying? Yeah. So, another thing about marketing is you want to stand out from from the crowd. So the first thing that I say to my students who want to meet women uh, online, which I don't encourage, but yeah. you know, customers always right. So if that's what they've come to me to help them with, I, I'll do what I. You know, I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah. Um. But I always say to him, look, think about everything that she's heard before and don't use it. <laughs> Very simple rule. Do not use what she has heard before. <laughs> yes, don't go true. in as low value. So yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of guys will go in low value. And they'll say, you know, I bet you get messages all the time. Well, immediately she's going to put you in the category of the guys who message her <laughs> that she rejects. Or... Um, you're so beautiful straight away. Yeah, yeah. You're so beautiful. Like she knows she's beautiful because you've con she knows you more importantly, she knows you think she's beautiful because because you wouldn't have contacted her in the first place. So sure. stop stating the bloody obvious, you know. <laughs> um, better to say something like, I always say, look at all the pictures she's put and make a comment that nobody else is gonna make. It doesn't mm. have to be rude, it can be cheeky and playful, that's fine. But it's gotta be something where, oh, no one's ever commented on that particular picture of yeah. what I was wearing. So you need to stand out. And but that's very important can... for guys. Women don't need to. Mm, interesting. Women, is, it's just, I always uh, say there are three things that men are looking for yeah. in what we call the initial stages of attraction, or you could say the, the, the selection stage. So yeah. we're not talking about, you know, what they're looking for in a long-term partner. This is just the early stages. Three things, looks, Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly so. Sure. So much, so much so that they will eclipse the next two. The looks will can eclipse the next two factors. Wow. The second one is availability. Okay. Makes sense. Yep. And the third one is compliance. So, is she friendly? Is she nice? Is she open, smiling? She's got bitchy resting face. You know, it's <laughs> going to be. She's. It's less. Com she's going to be less compliant. It's going to mm. be much more difficult. It's going to be more of a challenge. Yeah. So they're the three things that men are usually looking for. Whereas women are looking, f it, women's initial attraction is multi-layered. They're not just looking for looks, mm. availability. They're looking for how does he make me feel? Mm. It's very important. How does he make me feel? How does he operate the room? Mm. How does he handle himself as a man? How does he handle me? Mm. What's his body like? So many things. So wow. when men say women are too fussy for their own good, no, they're hardwired. Mm. So this could be a woman who you could look at and say, well, what right does she have to be fussy? I mean, she she looks like this or she's this age. Yeah. But that's, that's not getting it. They're hardwired. Mm. They could be 60 years old and they'll still have this very, very set um, mm. kind of ideas of what they want from their ideal man. Whereas a man, and, and this is not to downplay men or anything, yeah, but, yeah. but you know, all a woman really has to do is look nice in a picture and he's, you know, that's it. She doesn't need to make some special comment about mm. a photograph. Yeah. Man has to. And I think a lot of men get frustrated like like that about that. They think well, it should be an equal playing field, but it's not. But it's not. It's not. And there's no point in sulking about it, crying about it, bitching about it. Just play the game. Absolutely. Have, have you ever... Um well, yeah, of course, we'd never like name names, but like, have you ever come across anyone before or do you at least have the belief that there are some men that just cannot be helped? And as good as you are and as skilled as you are and as much knowledge as you've got, are there any individuals that you think this is impossible? You're never going to get it. No, it's not impossible. I don't think anything's impossible, mm -hmm. but I think that some is near impossible, should we say. Okay. And that's the ones who have a 
and I don't teach them. When I discover this, I stop training with them. So I, I'll train anyone unless, with one exception, if they hate women. Wow. So course. there's not understanding women, yeah. being frustrated by women, being confused. That's all good. But there are, and it's a movement going on now, the manosphere. And there's a lot, not all of it, but there's a lot of hatred towards women. You, did you say malosphere? Manosphere, the manosphere. Oh, manosphere. I've not, I've not heard this, this term movement. before. Right. Oh, like the sort of like Andrew Tate. Of right. This, and, this yeah. kind of, not maybe not Andrew Tate, but, but like him, this kind of thing, but right? But the people who follow him. Yeah, okay. And um, it's men, from what I can see, who've had a painful experience with a woman and have not healed. Mm. Have healed. So what they do is they, they use their platforms to purge right. that hatred and to, you know, give advice from a, a point of pain. Mm. Um, and I think that they they need to heal before they can start really understanding how attraction works because something that women and men pick up on is frustration. That's a very hard thing to get rid of. Yeah. And it's probably one of the most unattractive uh, features a person can have, men or women. Yeah, yeah. And what frustration does is it, it comes from neediness. It mm. comes from coming from a place of scarcity. Yeah, you're right. If you have an abundance mindset, you're not frustrated. You have that kind of take it or leave it attitude. Yeah. And both men and women absolutely love that. Meeting, you know, okay, you're married now. You have to sort of go way back, I suppose, 14 years ago when you were yeah. single. But you know when you met a woman and uh, she just, you know, sort of take it or leave it like yeah you know i'll call you sure maybe not it's yeah. almost like it's it, it's a bit frustrating for you but there's something about that person meaning they've got other options mm. and you like that whereas someone who's a bit intense yes <laughs> I, I, I could i couldn't oh. agree more it is honestly just and it doesn't the... matter how good looking they are <laughs> It's like done. Thank it's you, it's okay. the most unattractive thing in the world, isn't yeah. it? When someone's like really needy, really sort of latched on. There's that's what comes. It, it, it's all it encompasses everything. So if you're coming from a point of frustration, you're like, mm. then it's because you're coming from a place of scarcity, mm. and then you become needy and you become fixated and all these kind of horrible traits. You know, you become very intense or very. Yeah. Frustrated. And if the person's kind of like not really into you, mm. you sort of respond with you know, like a sort of low level anger, which is mm, frustration. Yeah, so unattractive. So I teach my students uh, to do something. I said, if you talk to a woman and she says, yeah, I'm not interested, but that's her prerogative. She's not being horrible. She's just being to the point. She's, you know, I'm just here with my friends. Thank you, but no, thank you. The best thing that you can respond with is no problem at all. Mm. Smile and say, I just wanted to say you're absolutely stunning and have a wonderful evening. Yeah. Now, there's three reasons why this works. The first is that you elevate your mood by mm. doing that. Mm. Because it's very easy to go, well, you know, I only came to you because I felt sorry for you. Or, or, or to be <laughs> most, a lot of guys react with shame. Sure. They're looking at me and mm. what did I say? And then out of that embarrassment, they could say something a bit nasty yes. or something they don't. They're very close together, those. Just the yeah. Frustration, shame, mm. anger. Again, it. It's all linked. It all comes from that horrible. Yeah, all unattractive. Yeah. Yeah. So if you turn around and say that to her, you've elevated your mood, you have your dignity intact, and something happens. Women are surprised by it, and they often either sort of look at you later on, you know, smile, yeah. and realize this is not a normal reaction he had. And remember, when you do it, you've got to have that almost regal confidence. Sure. It can't be this kind of half-hearted, you've got to be completely committed to it. Yeah. Have a wonderful evening. And she sees you talking to other women, this abundance mindset, mm. this, you know, positive mindset. Yeah. You you know, because she said no to you, doesn't matter, doesn't affect you. What of a duck's back. Wow. And then the second thing that she can do is actually come up to you and say, hey, mm -hmm. Sorry, I was a bit rude. That's her way of saying, let's let's start again. Yeah. Or third, and I've seen that with a lot of my clients, this with a lot of my clients, is they change their mind immediately. Mm. They go, oh, sorry, you know, 
Yeah, wow. That's powerful. That's really powerful. And this is where I knew this was going to be a really interesting conversation because, of course, with what I do within the Coaching Masters, it's all very much focused on coaching as in I train people that want to become qualified and accredited coaches. And there's a lot of different mindset tools, techniques, methods, frameworks, and they're very applicable to this. They're really applicable because I think most of coaching skills can be transferable over to different niches. But this is why I love having conversations like this with someone who's an expert in a very specific specific niche, just to see the ins and outs and the intricacies of how something like that would work. I remember years ago, and uh, this is so funny because just it's popped into my head and I've not thought about this in, in a really long time, but my brother, he's, he's seven years older than me. Uh, so naturally, as I was growing up, I kind of saw this older guy all of a sudden getting attention from girls and sort of dating and all of this stuff. And I was much younger. And I remember he used to watch this TV show and I think it was called the pickup artist yeah and there was a one yeah what was the guy's name he mystery. had a really mystery I've met him a few times mystery that was it and i remember my brother was really really into this They're obsessed people got this obsessed show with him. mystery that's really interesting i went to a bar with him and this was back in 2011 or 12 so he's still quite well known we went to a rooftop garden and there was a cue for him. Like he was a superstar and always yeah. like, who is this guy? Yeah. Pickup artist. VH1 mystery. That was right. And I, and I remember, I, I think I either just walked in one day or I just caught the end of maybe one episode. And he said something that stuck with me forever. And I'll never forget this. And I remember he said, if you're ever approaching a woman or a, a group of women at a table, always open with, I can't stay long. Oh, that's called um, oh a false time constraint. It's right. amazing. And now I found that really interesting because I just totally understood it. And he was like, because normally what will happen is you'll go there and they'll be thinking, fuck, you know, like, how long is this guy going to stick around for? But you're like, I, I, I can't stay, but I just wanted to say this one thing. And I thought, that's genius. It is. It's, it's, it's a very small alteration that mm. makes a big difference. Mm, it is. And, I, and I've applied it to the business sense in so many different aspects. You know, well, when time I, is precious. Time is precious. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I'm not going to intrude because I can't stay, but the, I just wanted to quickly make an introduction. It changes everything. People then value your time a lot more. The mm. person, that's the thing. You need an abundance mentality with everything apart from your time. <laughs> that's where your time is scarce and people wow. value it. Wow, that's a really interesting insight. So what 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 are some of the key the key things? Uh, obviously I'm sure there's so much that you teach, but are there what are some of the really high level things that you think we cannot do this without these these items that we're going to cover? What are some of the really key things that you teach your teach your clients and your students? In terms of attraction? Yeah, in terms of attraction. Um Gosh, I think that the main point is uh, they need to understand that this is a skill. Mm. And a lot of our students come to us and say, I don't have confidence. So they've already put themselves in a very low starting position. Mm. Rather than, words are very important. It's self-talk is very important. The words yeah. we use of other people um, can be manipulative in a good way, but also what we say to ourselves can be very manipulative mm. too, in a bad way. So if you say, well, I have no confidence. Well, we're starting from scratch. We're starting from ground zero here. But if you said, well, hold on, I've got confidence in this, that, I run a business, I know how to drive a car, I've got two kids. I've got a lot of confidence in this area, but this area I don't. Mm. Suddenly it's much easier. So much. And I know you're not emotionally... This is a problem. You've got to really emotionally disconnect yourself if you want to succeed. That sounds ruth. It is ruthless, but with yourself. Mm. I'm not saying be ruthless of other people. With yourself, you have to be very. The ego has to be put to the one side, and you can't be emotionally attached to what's going on. Mm. So the biggest uh, problem that, well, the most common problem that our students face is the uh, the approach mm. approach anxiety yeah i can imagine that ver that initial approach the first contact yeah they're, okay. they're very fixated on it almost mm. and a lot of them say well we're not going to do the seven day course because i just won't be able to get past that so it's actually the easiest thing to overcome but first of all they have to be emotionally disconnected from it now you can try and use certain self-talk and help them but the best thing to do 
is go out there, feel the burn, feel what you're frightened of, and then you become numb to it. Yes, that's so true. That's and so I, true. You have to feel the burn. So what happens is when you're approaching a woman, you, you can, you know, doing anything that you're really frightened of, it gets to a point where you kind of reach the most painful point. Mm. And then it subsides because you, you become numb to it. It's like, okay, that's the worst that can happen. Then you talk to the next girl and the next girl. And you're because you're going in there, almost like it doesn't affect you emotionally. It doesn't hurt you. There's, you don't feel the pain anymore. The fog lifts. Mm. So that fog is the fog of fear. And it lifts and then you start getting clarity. You start thinking, right, what do I do next? What What's the next chess move? Mm. I always say game is very much like chess. Mm. Someone who's frustrated, angry, intense, they make the terrible chess moves. The person who just sees it as a strategy, they're, they're going into it, not emotionally connected to it, just disconnected from it. Yeah. They can just think strategically, they do well. Mm -hmm. And that's how they get over the approach. They go through the pain and it's never as bad as they think it's gonna be. <laughs> they get numb to it and then they go, right, what, what did Kezia say I need to do next? What, what went wrong in that interaction? And how do I fix it? Clarity. You can't do that if you are too emotionally invested mm. in that moment and you're too outcome dependent. How, how important is it to detach yourself from the outcome itself and not be too worried about whether or not it is a successful or unsuccessful outcome? Very hard, very hard balancing act because I I think it has to go with the kind of person you are. Mm. So there's a, a lot you can say about someone who's not outcome dependent they do have that kind of take it or leave it back to that kind of abundance. Let's just have fun, see where it goes. Yeah, That's very attractive. Mm. But if you need motivation, then you should be, it mo like you shouldn't be outcome dependent. Let's change the phrase of that. You should be goal, you should be goal orientated. So mm. again, let's change the phrasing, outcome dependency, I'm dependent, it's a, like I am dependent on alcohol. Dependency mm. is just a horrible. Yeah, it is, question. isn't it? It really you is. You said, well, no, I'm goal orientated. I'm goal focused. Suddenly, yeah. it's, but let's do this. If you're somebody who can be motivated just simply by saying, I like people, I like meeting people, um, and then that's all I need, then good. Mm. Do the first one. But if you're someone who needs that kick or they just, you know, drift through life, yeah, then. Yeah, be honest with yourself and say, I like that woman. I want to get her number. Let's do this. I love that answer. I love that. I think that strikes the perfect balance, not being outcome dependent, but being goal orientated to be enough to be motivated, but not so much that you're going to be like a whinger, a whiner, and you need the outcome and you're going to be complaining about it and getting frustrated if not. It's just that that balance. So you you've do you find that your students find it difficult to strike that balance. I know you mentioned that is a difficult one to strike. It is, but it, but again, we work with them quite inten uh, intensely and um, they usually can find out what kind of person they are. We also do an Enneagram test. Are you familiar with the Enneagram? No, what's that? Oh my God, <laughs> you've got to get familiar. This is a complete game changer. Yeah. So the Enneagram is, I mean, I won't go on about it too much. I mean, sure. Your viewers can Google it, but it's, uh, and a lot of them have probably heard about it. Yeah. But there's like nine different personality types. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is kind of like the, when you're like ENTJ. No, but that is, from, in my opinion, Yeah. really bad. That's really bad. So this is like a, an, another very, version of this. Yeah, but it's very old and it's much more sophisticated, much more in depth. Enneagram. Yeah. Okay, so what we do is we do an Enneagram test on them. So we can find out what sort of is there. We can tap into their frequency. It's a shortcut. I don't have to do it, but it is a bit of a shortcut. Yeah. So find out their type. And I think, okay, so I'm a three, for instance, and we're just highly motivated people. Like when we want something, we do it. You know? Yeah. But if he's a nine or a seven, those tend to be people who they need the motivation to actually go and do something. So then those people wouldn't just be those uh, kind of natural kind of people just say, yeah, I'm just gonna meet people. They're just kind of like, oh, I'll watch TV actually. Oh. And mm. suddenly they're, they've wasted a whole day. Mm. So those people would need to mm. have the 
goal mindset. Mm. That, does that make sense? Totally, one hundred percent. What's what, what's the process of that of that test? The Enneagram test is. Oh, I mean, I just have an online test that I use. I've, nice. There's lots of online tests, but this is the one after I've studied it since two thousand and seven. Okay, so I'm. You know, it's not like I'm. You know, I'm going to do it. Oh, you have to. Yeah, I'd love and to. Get your wife to do it. Yeah, because um, I'm really naughty now. When I go on dates with guys, I'm like, oh, have you seen this silly personality test? <laughs> and they go, oh, what's this? I go, oh, it's just a silly thing. Just do it, do it. And they do it. And it's like, right, now I know how to tap into them. Love that. It's a bit manipulative. I love that. But like you mentioned before, you were like manipulative in, in a, a positive way. Because yeah. imagine if, if I could manipulate someone to fully believe in themselves, then of course manipulation is yeah. 100%. So I mean, yeah. Frustration, we've mentioned this, is clearly unattractive. What are some of the other very, very common traits that you see amongst men that are those very unattractive states, but you just see it all the time? Playing, uh, playing not to lose rather than playing to win. Tell me about that. So have you ever heard of the whole like nice guys finish last? I have heard that, yes. Right. Now, a lot of guys misinterpret that as the good guys finish last. Right, okay. Two different things. You've yeah. got the nice guy, you got the bad guy, you got the good guy. Uh, the nice guy, he does finish last. He's the one who is watered down his personality. It's like he's wearing a filter. Yeah. And because he's playing not to lose. Mm. So he thinks, okay, I've spoken to her. It's going well. Now I'm going to be really careful. I'm not going to rock the boat. <laughs> If she says she likes pizza, I like pizza. Oh, no. If she changes her mind about pizza five minutes, I've changed my mind. The it, worst. Yeah. I mean, I'm exaggerating here, but, you know, and they get, they get, it's not even over keen. They're so worried mm. about her suddenly changing her mind or finding mm. someone better that they become needy again. It ends up being, please like me. Please, please, please. please. Like I'll me. like what you like. I'll dislike what I'll you like. I'll bend Just my own reality in accordance with yours. Just mm. like me. And girls can smell it a mile away. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got the good guy and the bad guy. And we say like, they're, they're interested in the good guy and bad guy because they have the shadow selves. Mm. And that's what people find appealing. It's like a lot of people say, oh, why does she like guys who are like that? He's, he's so mean and horrible, but it's like the shadow side that they find attractive mm. on both of them. Whereas the nice guy doesn't have a shadow side. Mm. He's just very one dimensional. Yeah, You can second guess him. He's predictable. And by the way, predictability is the enemy of attraction. Mm. Just think about it. You know, like you've been with someone and you kind of like, they're okay. You like them. And then you start predicting everything they're going to do next. Like they're going to have that opinion <laughs> and you start hating them. <laughs> you know, like you really like, oh my God, you don't speak. <laughs> and it's really bizarre. Do they call that the ick? This is what I've heard, the ick, yeah, when you the get ick. the, the ick lot, for I someone. I a lot of icks. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I've, it can be very difficult to get rid of the ick, where you're just like, oh, no, I'm, yeah, I have yeah. it now, so it's just there. And right. it can be difficult yeah. to reverse no, it, I've, I've heard. Yeah, difficult, but not impossible. Okay. There are things that guys can do, and we can talk about the friend zone and things like that. But to answer your question, I think, men, it's very important that they go in there uh, with a, a play-to-win attitude, which mm. is not, you know, you'll be more bold. Mm. It's very important for a man to be bold. Yeah. Um, I would say that's important. So don't feel like she's going to walk out on you just because, you know, you don't like the same pizza toppings as she does. The another, another one which leads me nice, it's a nice segue, is a lot of men fixate on trying to find things in common. Yeah. And often there's nothing, you have nothing in common with this woman. Like mm. she likes this and you like that. So yeah. get it. And so it's important that men understand that commonalities breed friendships, mm. but connection breeds attraction. So connection's different to commonality. So if you meet a girl and she says, I don't know, I, I, I like tennis mm. and you don't like tennis. Mm. You could say to her, you know, why do you like tennis? Mm. What's it about? And she might say, I like the competitiveness. And you mm. go, oh, that's funny. I'm very competitive too, but I do it through this way. Sure. You're connecting. Mm. You're connecting on an emotion and a feeling that something gives you rather than the byproduct. I love that. That is such a beautiful way of putting it. Commonality creates friendship. Mm -hmm connection creates attraction. Wow, that's a really good way of thinking about it. Everyone write that down, make a note of that. Boldness, let's talk about boldness. Now, I wanna go down this avenue for selfish reasons because I like being bold and it's something that I've always 
liked about myself, which I'm more than happy to say and more than happy to talk about. I have no issues talking about the elements of myself that I really, really like. And I've got no problem talking about the elements of myself that I struggle with. Very open and very transparent like mm. that. Um, I like being bold and I find that I am bold in different ways. I'm bold in the actions that I take. I'm bold in the conversations that I have and the things just in general, just I find that to be thing. Now, how can someone create that when they don't naturally have it? Mm. So you can be bold in different ways. I mean, would you say you're an extrovert or an introvert? I'm an extrovert. Yeah, so I'm an extrovert too. So it comes quite easily to us. Yeah. Um, and a lot of introverts, they kind of think, I can't do that. I, I can't say what he said or she said. It's it's too much. Mm. So they can do things in a more subtle way, okay? They could do things. I'm not saying you're not subtle. but um, <laughs> Sure, sure. No, I get it. Yeah, they can do things such as... Okay, you. From what I can, I can tell from what you said, it's like you do something I do, which is you own it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's very, very, very important. You know, you own your faults. This totally, hundred percent. And and you, you almost you say it before they've even said it, so that the person can't attack you with it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example for me. So a woman ages ago, she said to me, "Why, why do you wear such provocative clothing on your videos?" And I said, "Well, why do you think?" Mm. And she goes, "Well, I don't know." <laughs> I said, because I like male attention. <laughs> and once you've said it, they, they can't use it as a weapon against you. For sure. You've owned, they, you, yeah, I like this. I've, I've said what nobody else is saying. But it's Openness, true, but transparency, like, transparent. That's love it. Transparent. Mm. And I believe that more introverted people can do it, but it, it doesn't need to be to, it doesn't have to have, to have that, that shock factor. Mm. So a lot of guys will say to me, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm quite... Um, quiet, uh, I'm not the guy who's going to be the life and soul of the party. Okay, that's you, own it. Mm. Say to her, you know, I pref I'm one of those people who prefer to, to listen rather than speak. Yeah. You can run down extroverted people to a certain point. You can say, I always mm -hmm. find that those people have got a lot to say. You mm -hmm. know, they're, they're mm -hmm. speaking all the time and they're not very reflective. You can sort of like mm -hmm. put them down a little bit to sort of make you seem a bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use also different words. Again, it goes back to self-talk. Like rather than saying I'm shy and quiet, yeah. you can say like, I'm I'm sort of um, um, inquisitive. Reflective. I'm reflective. reflective. Yeah. I like to watch. Mm. You know, and it becomes this. Uh, you know, I look at it's like James Bond. James Bond's not the extrovert. He was always the quiet one. And For sure. So mm. you can have you can sort of look at these people and say, well, how did they do it? Mm. Rather than always thinking, I need to be that guy. Be yourself. Be the best version of yourself. Definitely. But but own it. Mm, own it. Ownership. I mean, that is a really key thing, isn't it? That very much goes back to those people that are like, you don't like pizza. I don't like pizza. You love it. I love it. There's no ownership. Yeah. There's no ownership over who they are, what They're they like. Your lead. They're following your lead. How how often do you see? And I'm I'm going to use my own terminology of of mistake because I feel like this is a mistake. But how often do you see men falling into the trap and making the mistake of leading with money? leading with oh, i'm just gonna what i'll do is i'll buy you lots of things and that must mean that i love you and therefore you're gonna really like me for it it's getting worse yeah i can imagine it is getting worse it's getting worse because there's a lot of focus now on social media i mean i don't know what your instagram is my, my instagram is very humble mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um i've got you know it, it's i don't show off my wealth on it okay it's, it's yeah. not for me sure you know? but a lot of men are now starting to use their wealth and and some of it's not their wealth. It's we all know it's rented goods and things. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they're using that because they're trying to impress women who have become very kind of um, how can I put this? You know, focused on on wealth and and money and what they can get and and a lot of it is very strange. Instagram has got its own kind of currency, mm. <laughs> which is you know women. When I was younger, you'd have gold diggers for sure. And you'd have women kind of like using guys for nice holidays. Like you always had that. Kind yeah. Of, but now you've got women using guys so they can get a photograph at a specific <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. You think, oh my God, like really? You're doing, <laughs> there's not even a handbag out of it? <laughs> <laughs> not encouraging it, but you know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting, I think isn't it? Men are starting to, you know, sort of 
create this lifestyle mm. or this image of a lifestyle to attract women that way yeah yeah, yeah. and then woman benefits because all she wants is her nice photograph <laughs> she's like well that's easy you know we can arrange that that's so interesting and isn't it a lot of the stuff on this manosphere also is it it says to men look you, you've got to go work at the gym and have a good career and make the money because otherwise she's not going to be interested in you that's rubbish yeah there's a lot Tell that to the millions and millions of men out there who don't have a lot of money and have a woman in their life. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's a there's an interesting film actually that just popped into my head as you were explaining that. And um, it's called Spread oh, with Ashton Kutcher. It. Oh my God, I knew you were going to say that. I just had this feeling. I was like, he's going to say Spread because... No, I don't know why. I just had this feeling. It was funny. No one else has mentioned it. Love it. I keep telling people, watch Spread. It's so good. And I tell you Nobody's what- When he's in the car and he's like, just yeah. act like a, like a <laughs> dork. They love it. And he's so right. Like he gets game, this guy. Totally gets it, right? Totally fully gets it. And- um, All wealthy women. Yeah. Got and nothing. And he, me he says, I got nothing. <laughs> and that's the thing, isn't it? He doesn't need to have loads of money. He doesn't have, he doesn't have any money, but he's got a lot of charisma. And he's and he's bold, you know. He knows the chess moves. And he knows the chess moves. He actually says, "Remember, this is bit." He's like, he opens the window and he's like doing this stupid voice on that. Yeah. that's a bit. I go so good. And I showed my sister that. I said, "Look at this bit. Don't we like guys like that?" She goes, "Yes, it's the ones that they really don't care." Yeah, hundred percent. They, they don't care what you think of them at that moment. What 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 is that? Do you think? Like, what's the what's the reason as why that's abundance. Abundance, Think about it. Yeah. All, all the roads, all roads lead to that. So, if a guy thought I'm gonna maybe lose this woman if I do something like that, and I'm not gonna do it, there's always this kind of um, mm. he's not quite sure, putting on a bit of a act. But if you ma imagine, like I'm, I'm in a car and I'm seeing a guy completely dork out, like yeah, that, yeah. owning it and having a good time in the moment. <laughs> Is being a dork attractive? No, it's the fact that if I, he, it's not even a risk to him. It's like, this is fun. I'm going to do this. It's just him. Very important. Like even men feel the same about women. So mm -hmm. I had this client and he went on a date with a girl and she was very pretty. He said she was very dressed up, looked lovely. And he said, oh, I just didn't want to see her again. I said, well, what was it? He goes, I don't know. He, he couldn't put his finger mm, on it. Interesting. A few months later, he said, I gave I gave her another go, like as I called her and she wasn't answering my messages suddenly. And then suddenly it was like, okay, a bit more interested. And then she turned up to the date and she was kind of like in a hoodie, not much makeup, hadn't made a much of it. It wasn't rude to him or anything, but you could yeah. see the effort wasn't there. He's like, right, now I'm hooked. So right. the other one, yeah. and you, I mean, again, you're married, it's a bit difficult to use this <laughs> on you, but I'm sure a lot of your viewers who are men hmm. say, you know, it's nice that the woman's made an effort. No one's because you know, she's got her hair and everything, but you know when it's just kind of like, there's too much effort. It's yeah. pick me, pick me. And mm. women do it too. And it doesn't have quite the same ick effect on men, but it, it does. Yeah, but sure. Women, it's like really. Yeah, yeah, it's really icky. Yeah, this is really, it's really interesting. So with, with the women who are at that stage, I guess, that are like at the pick me, pick me stage, what, what do you think contributes towards that? Because like we were saying, really, it's more hardwired that men will kind of be a bit more like that and women won't be, I guess. So women will do it when they find, women do it when they are attracted to a man because it's so hard for okay. them to be attracted to a man. And and I've done it. I've been completely like, oh my God, goodness. Mm. I've got to keep this one. But I noticed that the beginning part, when I'm less interested, I've got them wrapped around my finger, you know, mm. and then suddenly there's a shift mm. and I start becoming needy. I right. start, mm. and I'm, because I understand the, um, you know, how, how this all works because of what I do, I can hide it. Yeah. I can camouflage it. Right. And even if you're an expert at camouflaging and hiding it, you can slip up mm. because I'll give you an example. So with my students, they, I always say to them, treat them, the women, the way that you treat the women you're not interested in, mm. which is almost impossible mm. because you're invested in them. If you get a woman's number, when do you usually call if you're not that interested? Sometimes I forget. Good, then forget. Call, oh, sometimes three days later. Okay, you're going to do exactly what you do with that, the women that you're not interested in. I can't because I'll lose her. So it goes back to that. Yeah, and scarcity. You, stop, you make the bad chess moves. There's mm -hmm. no strategy. It's just, I'm going to lose this person. Mm. And 
you you'd be so surprised at how many times you don't lose that person, and it, mm. you even gain more attraction. So even with me, I'm like, I have you have to be so disciplined. I'm like, oh, he's texted me. I'll wait an hour. I wait. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, no, no, no. It's got to be eight hours. No, it's got to be longer than that. If I'm really serious, about it, it's got to be two days. And you just think, no, he'll he'll meet another girl and fall in love with her. <laughs> <laughs> the worst case scenario. That scarcity mindset is everything. It's everything. Yeah, it's it's like it's primal, isn't it? You know, it's survival. It's almost like the amygdala being so fearful that we're like, no, you got to message them right now because a man's we'll lose doing them. it because he's on on the whole worried he's not going to sleep with the girl, mm. and the girl's worried about it because you know if she's really attracted to the guy, she's building her whole life around him. Right, that's interesting, yeah. isn't it? So different in that instance as well. With with your students, because all your students are men, all right? Them, yeah. Which uh, and I'm sure I'd have absolutely no doubts that if you chose to have female students, you'd be very successful there as well. But you've picked your niche. Yeah. Okay. Tell me. Tell me. Only because I feel and. Uh, it's, I feel that with men, once they've made the decision to say, right, I need to do something about this, once they finally made that decision, they are very good at putting their ego to one side and being quite like, what do I need to do about this? Mm. Don't don't feed me crap. Don't tell me how wonderful I am. Just tell me what I need to do. Interesting. Whereas I think women make the decision quicker. Yeah. You know, women are like, oh, I need help in this. I need to do something about this. But I do feel that you've got to slightly sugarcoat things with women. In my experience, I have to sort of flatter them a little bit more. I have to tell them nice things before I go in with the <laughs> Interesting. Know. Yeah, whereas yeah. I'm not that kind of person. I'm no. not very good at being, you know, I'm not very good at niceties. I do mm. try, but yeah. it's something I have to work on. But you're, it's, that's your truth, isn't it? You know, and if you're going to approach this, you've got to approach it as you. I know what my weakness, I know what my shortcomings are, but I can help women with their marketing. Right, because of course. Because it's not... It's not personal then. When you're trying mm. to teach a woman how to attract men, that's very personal. You yeah. start talking about looks and, th mm. and you know, some women can handle it, but mm. a lot of women, they sort of haven't quite, I think with men, mm. most men, if I just offered out advice, you should do this and that, they tell me to shut up. Like, how dare you speak to me like that? But once they've made that decision, mm. men are quite like, right, Let's do this. Quite moldable at that point. Yeah, they can take it on the chin, you know. <laughs> have you, have you, is there a particular avatar that you find your students fall into or are they all just drastically different? Uh, yeah, we've the youngest we've had is 18. The oldest is, I think it was 79 or 80. Wow, yeah, okay. His daughter signed him up for it because he was a widow. He lost his wife recently and she wow. said, you've got... You, you got to do this, Dad. Wow. It's very sweet, actually. It's, it's some of the, the 18 rolls we've had, it's the father. <laughs> that's <laughs> it the really? The 18th birthday, yeah. Wow. Three or four times. Tell, tell me a little bit about that and what's your what's your personal take on that? I was just, I think it's great. I mean, the dads just, you know, they can see their sons going in a certain direction <laughs> and they're living now in, in a time where... It's very mixed messages for young young mm. boys and men. It's very confusing time for them. Mm. You know, on one hand, they're saying, you know, you should you, you should be confident and you know you should get off your phone and speak to people mm. like in the old fashioned way. And on the other hand, they're saying, oh, you shouldn't you know make women feel uncomfortable. Mm. And it's it's confusing. Less, they've got less role models now. So a lot of the dads, you know, they sometimes they see that they wasted time in their life. So they project it onto their son, but yeah. a lot of them see it as they think their sons are going through something difficult, right? A difficult kind of era to navigate in. Yeah. And they think, well, hold on, we send it to a guy, God knows what he'd be saying. And a woman, a woman's not going to say anything that's going to hurt women. Mm. So that's why they pick me. Yeah, for sure. No, and I see that. And I think that works really beautifully, actually. I think you are the perfect person to learn from in this field. Very approachable. You're incredibly charismatic. Thank you. Kezia, very charismatic. You're extremely easy to talk to as well. And I, and I can imagine as one of your students, that makes the whole experience a lot more enjoyable because you're doing something very vulnerable. You yeah, know? No, you're right. And um, but I think a lot of it is, and it is when you get experience. If someone says, if someone says, well, who's this person? They've just like the new kid on the block. They can be like, well, we don't know the reputation yet. Yeah. I've been doing it for such a long time. Mm. So there's trust in that. But also another thing that I do, mm. which I think is incredibly important for anybody who's starting a business, who has a business, is to get as many video testimonials as you possibly can. Absolutely. Written testimonials, all very well, but 
unless it's on TripAdvisor, <laughs> you've written them yourself. That's what you think, right? <laughs> so true, so true. Now, so so no avatar then. So there isn't a particular no, type I of mean, avatar. The 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 most we could say that there's a lot of common problems, but no, it, a yeah. lot of them are in their thirties because it, it's it's completely normal. That's when their friends are coupling up. Um, they're at that point. They can go to they can't go to clubs as much. They're losing their wingmen a bit. Mm. They lose. They come out of a relationship. A lot of them that they thought was going to last forever. Yeah, You've seen that guys who've been like yeah. 35, 34. It's like that mm. funny age. Mm. Oh. Yeah, and that's an interesting one as well, isn't it? Because I can imagine what they do is they project themselves straight back to when before they got with that woman, and maybe they were eighteen years old, or yeah. maybe they were twenty-one. Yeah. And of course, they're older now. Things have changed. Things have changed. Meet each other and communicate, like you know, some people are relying on dating apps and things. Yeah, a lot of them jump into dating apps thinking that's going to be the solution. So right. a lot of our students have said, you know, I, I spent two, three years. On dating apps mm. because they've been marketed as a silver bullet. Yeah, and I find it fascinating. Like the whole, the whole, the whole thing, I find it really fascinating. And I think it's because my relationship predates dating apps, and it and it predates what year was dating. It? What year was that? So we got together in '09. It had, yeah. Because there was things like plenty of fish that were like websites, <laughs> right? And I remember, I remember people talking about stuff you like that. Thought cringe <laughs> in those days. Yeah, in those, in those days, acceptable. for sure, a hundred percent. The the apps, I don't believe, were around in '09. I don't think so. I, I, I remember. No, I don't think so. No, I remember when Tinder came out because my friend had it when uh, 2012. 2012, exactly. When I was in like just university, that, yeah. I just I just missed it. Good but for you. but I also missed the whole dating thing. Full stop. That's interesting. Yeah, I know a few guys like you, but yeah, and I find that fascinating because yeah. I tell you the weird thing about it, Kezia, in my mind is that when you're well, I'm, I'm I can't talk for all men, of course, but for me as a young man. I remember that being something I was really excited about. And we know when I was like 14, 15, 16, I was like, when I'm older, I'm going to live on my own. I'm going to be making money and I'm going to be at a date and I'm going to go on all these dates. And of course, I met my wife when I was 19 before any of that stuff even happened. So it was it was never a part of my life. It was just never a part of my experience. So whenever I've, I've just been fascinated by the whole thing, because often you'll hear, the negatives about it, oh, you know, God, I'm in the dating pool or it's not going very well. I've got to go on another bad date. But I, that's where I feel like people, I feel like anyone would benefit from what you do. Yeah. Not I just, pe- <laughs> honestly, I really do. Not even just people that are like struggling to date or struggling to pick up women, but even those that don't struggle, but want those additional skills and that additional mindset and what comes, because it's just, I think it's so valuable because from an outsider's perspective, what you teach is communication. Yes. Genuine yeah, communication. Yeah. Transparent conversations. So that important. That are also uh, connective and impactful. That's very important. You need, a lot of guys, you know, they just sort of talk to a woman and think, you know, I'm just going to sort of, they're very lazy. Mm. Where are you from? I'm from London. Okay. <laughs> what part? And so it's, you're on this, yeah. you know, she knows the pattern. So mm. I always say to the guys, look, the early stages, you need to be, communicating high value data about yourself. Yeah. That doesn't mean, oh, I'm Mr. I, I own a Porsche. No, it's high value data, something that's interesting that she can latch on to, mm. okay? And you need to listen to a woman. Mm. No, listening doesn't mean sort of just nodding your head and then sort of, go, you know, sort of ch- tuning out and making it look like you're listening, <laughs> but you pick up on things that she said. So, so many guys will talk to a woman, ask her a question, and she, he, he'll get an answer that he doesn't know what to do with. So, yeah. they'll go, where are you from? And she'll say, I'm from Lithuania. And he goes, well, I know nothing about that. So, uh, what part of Lithuania? So, it makes it worse. Yeah. Oh, from this small town. Oh, okay. Well, I've never been there. What do you like to do for fun? And, and the woman feels like, well, you're not really, you're just sort of looking for something that, again, you can talk about. Yeah. But if you said, oh, Lithuania, I've never been there. And, you know, I love traveling but I've never been there. Yeah. Tell me what makes it amazing. Exactly. So you've offered Tell me information about that. though. I like to travel mm. for your next question. Interesting. Yeah, you have yeah. to sharing information. Sharing and asking. High value data. Because I've always looked at it from, 
I, I, of course, I've never been on a, a date, you know, apart oh, from, funny. which is really crazy, you know, and I can't even. No, it's very sweet. <laughs> I can't even say I've been on a date with my wife because we got together so young. We weren't even, we didn't date, you know, kind we just of kind date, of. wasn't it? I, well, we met we're at work. Drink. Went met at work. We so, were drink together at least. You know what? Not even that. You just got married. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'll tell you what, but <laughs> it's very Disney. It's quite Disney. and But the thing is, because we worked together, that was essentially our four. Form of dating you know we saw each other every day yeah, that's, it's the, it's the war, warm i know it's a slow burn it's wonderful those exactly. meeting, i mean yeah. meeting people in the office and at work is still the best way because you really get to know them you get to see how they you do people around them stress it's you know exactly meeting on a, a cold approach so by the time we were going out and having drinks together we were together yeah you already kind of knew each we other. always kind of knew each other but having said that i've always thought i would be quite good at dating and I can see that. There's only, for me, there's like one major thing that I kind of look at from an outsider's perspective and I see it and I think, but why are you just not doing this? And it's the ability to ask questions, mm -hmm. interesting, thought-provoking questions that haven't been asked before, or at least there's an extremely good chance they've not been asked before, that will instill emotions, mm -hmm. positive emotions that haven't been felt for trigger, a long time. Emotions also. Yeah. To trigger emotions. And I kind of look at it from outside the sector and I think that's that's got to be a key part of it, surely. But I wouldn't know because I've I've never dated before. But how important is that? The the asking questions that trigger emotions that are unique. So a woman's had 10 dates and she's like, I'm fucking bored on every single one of these because they just ask me where I'm from. They ask me this bullshit that like doesn't make me feel anything. And then all of a sudden you've got a guy that comes along and he's asking questions I've never heard before. And then and that's making me feel emotions I've not felt in a long time in a really good way. How important do you, do you think that is? It's not just even asking questions, it's your responses also that are mm. very important. So, you know, when she asks you, you know, what do you do? And you say, I'm in IT. <laughs> right. And then you, she says, well, you know, what's it like? And then if you, oh, it's okay. Mm. She's not getting any value from that. But if you said, if you just change your response and say, you know what, it's the best job in the world and the worst job in the world. Yeah. It's called conversation clickbait. Conversation clickbait. She's interested, like, why, why is it the best and the worst? You know, I love it and I hate it. Use these two extremes. So wow. just that response can make someone say, oh, just sit up, mm. create that hairline shift in their perception of you. He's not like the other guys. Mm. That doesn't mean, oh, she's wildly attracted to you now. Mm. But it's, a, it's just changing. Wow. It's very gradual. I love that. And the way you compliment a woman, we haven't even spoken about compliments. I mean, you know, I little, little alterations again that can make a huge difference. Rather than saying to a woman, you're beautiful, I think you're beautiful. Make it about you and her, mm. not just about her. Yeah. I think you're beautiful. Or you can say, I like the way that you do this. I like the way you, you, you do your makeup. Most women don't have a clue how to do makeup. So you make that distinction between women yeah. who haven't made the mark and the woman. Mm. It's more personal. I love I love that. And and a lot of the time, because I I, I haven't dated and you know and and I guess I won't be unless I go on dates with my wife, which which is totally different, like of course. Of course. So so yeah. unbelievably different. Um but yeah, uniqueness is something that stands out to me a lot as as you're talking. And I'm often applying it to a business sense as well, like mm. whether it's someone I want to network with. How do you think this would go down during a date? If someone was to say, can I tell you something I've never told anyone? And then led in with something yeah. completely unique about themselves that they genuinely maybe have or haven't ever told anyone. But I like the idea of creating something between two people that doesn't exist anywhere else. It only exists here during this conversation. It's not for anyone else. It's just for us. I, I like that. I feel like I'm attracted to that. Do, what's your opinion no, as really an expert? Good. Yeah, to mm. say like, yeah, to say I'm attracted to this, making it about you. Mm. But you said something at the very beginning, which is, can I tell you something? That, that I've never told anyone. That's, a, that's we call that conversational clickbait. Of of course, you just used that term before, okay. didn't you? Wow. And okay. You, do, you probably do it naturally. Mm. There are some people who are naturals at it. Like um, you could even say that this is potentially going to sound very random. Yeah. I say yes, absolutely. You approach a girl, always say, "Look, this is so random." It's the perfect lead. -in. Immediately, when it's random, it means it's not been calculated. It's kind of like 
Mm. It's one of those things that you have no control over. Of. Mm. So I said to go say, this is so random, but I had to come over and say. Exactly. Exactly. Like, words are important. They're so How many important. Times have a guy said to a woman, I was standing over there watching you. It's like, well, you know, go back and stand there and watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about something along the lines of, I'm going to tell you something that you probably have never heard before? I would say slightly arrogant. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's true, you, true, true. You're like me, you're like quite a a big character and yeah. probably are used to saying stuff. To, if you said that to somebody who was a big character, it would work. But shy people get quite intimidated by people saying, you know, I can peer into your soul. I can mm. see everything about you. They don't like it. Mm, that's interesting. So, what was the line again? I alter it. It was, can, um, it was I'm going to tell you something that you've probably never heard before. You said probably, which is good. Say, I'd say, I would ask permission on that because mm. it's such a bold statement. I put the little permission part at the first to sort of even it out. And That's say, good. May I, may I tell you something that I believe you've never heard before? You see what I mean? That's so good. Counterbalance the the very, you know, almost overconfident. Yeah, because it's still very bold and still very forward, but you've got the, the, thing the polite thing at yeah. the beginning. Wow. They, you know, when they say, yeah, of course, they feel like it's more it's a level playing field rather than you've got all the power. Mm. They've given a, they, their permission to you, which is part of it. Part yeah. Of the game. Uh, w w once again, it's interesting because you know the book, The Game, right? Mm, I've read it twice. Yeah. there's, And I remember my brother had that book and I think Great that's why, why he got into watching um, Mystery. And uh, I, I've not read it before, but just based on the conversations that I've had with people, I can imagine that there are so many useful things that you can relate to business in that book. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because I've, I've not actually read it, but I think because I'm such a firm believer that business is built upon relationships and the success of those relationships, it just seems like the kind of approach that would be very useful in a business sense. Yeah, it, it yes, it. I can see it as someone who owns a business. Um, I think of the untrained eye, it would go over their heads. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of silliness in that book also, you know, it's, it's a bit of a silly book. And yeah. So, but I loved it. I mean, but yeah, I mean, like I said, I, you know, the 10 principles of attraction I have applied to to sales and marketing. Mm. And the funny, and I've written in the, in the book how this came about, but I, it was back in uh, years ago, 2015 or 14, and I had a student from America and he ran a um, copywriting company. Mm. And he said to me, well, you know, what have you, where did you learn? To copyright, I said, learn. He said, well, who? no, he, sorry, he didn't ask me. He asked, who's doing your copywriting for you? So that was it. And I said, no, I do my own. And he didn't believe me. He said, no, you're lying. Really? Well, I am doing it all. He said, well, you're using certain techniques that someone would not be able to, to use unless they'd studied it. And then we had a session and we sat down and we, we sort of, he said, it was after the week he'd been with us. And he said, I, I've seen now that there are, principles in seduction. Yeah. So I said, he said, you, you, you're you using them as a result and not realize. So it's fed into, so what you're teaching us is fed in to your marketing. Wow. So he's the one who said, I've noticed it. It was this man. But I said, the more that my marketing gets better, the more my seduction techniques get better. Mm, that is so really they interesting. Into, they feed into each other. And, and I see said, why. You should write a book about this one day. Yes, and, and that's the that's the latest book, yeah. isn't it? I, Eight years later. I completely 100% see why, because, you know, of course, good marketing is good at seduction, I guess. Well, someone said something really interesting to me about marketing ages ago, and it's never, ever left me. And they said, as well as attracting your ideal client, you're also trying to repel the people you don't want to work with. Yes. And that really stood out to me because I thought so many people are, of course, just focusing on it. own get, get, get. Can I get more people in my space? But also the repelling of the people that you don't want around you is so important. What element of, this, of that what element of that does that play? Oh my God, I can't get my fucking words out. What <laughs> element of that idea plays into dating and seduction? The idea of oh, actually repelling oh. the people you don't want. Yeah, yeah. We call it the filtering system. Okay. So I always say to guys, look, a lot of guys, they, um, I said, what do you want in your ideal woman? Oh, nice smile, nice body. <laughs> Let's get into detail. Mm. They think the more detail I add, the less options I'll have. And I said, no, 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 no. What happens is a guy who goes in there who says, I don't have a time. I'll, 
says is he's not open minded. He's he's saying I'll have whatever I can get. Right. Women don't want that. No. So I sit down with them and say, right, let's do a list of what you like. And it can be anything you want. Don't don't put in that list what you think other guys would put. No. If you like a bitchy woman, put it in. Yeah. If you like a quiet, put it in. I had one, he said, oh, I like a, a, a psycho bitch. And I was like, put it in. That's what you want. Put it in. And then what happens is you start being able to ask certain questions to see, are they that kind of woman? Mm. And you're the one with the box. Because there's always women going in there, very clear idea of what they want. And the men mm. kind of going, right, who's available? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So, yeah, we do have something like that. And it's the filtering system. Women use it all the time. They mm. ask us, mm. you can watch the questions I ask them. What do you do? Mm. And they're filtering. They're filtering mm. very quickly. Okay, time wasting. Whatever. And they do that naturally, I naturally, guess, because yeah. it's like because it's hardwired. They, they have more options. Mm. Ah, okay, interesting. Because men tend to be hardwired around. Do they look good? That's great. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's all I need. Men have less options than women, though. I mm. mean, it's like even a woman who's really, let's say, not attractive at all. If she stands around in a nightclub for long enough, she'll find someone to go yeah. back home with. Right. Whereas a man, even a good-looking guy. Yeah. Sometimes it's not going to go home with anyone. So no. a woman always knows whatever happens, I, I'll probably find someone tonight. Yeah. So again, it gives them that advantage where they can be picky. What is a topic or a question that you never get asked that you, when you do a podcast or you do an interview, you think, I really wish someone would ask me about that. <laughs> I've done so many. They've been asked. <laughs> um, Something that you think, God, I'd love to talk about that, but I don't often get the opportunity to talk about that particular thing. Um, I, I could say something about smartphones. I feel very passionately about Tell me. I don't know how much that's going to relate to this conversation. Well, it was the thing that your subconscious yeah. mind offered up. I'd love right. to hear about it. So I get like, I've seen what phones do to people. Um, a lot of people say social media is doing to people. I think it's phones. Mm. So if you imagine like you could only have not even a laptop that you can take into your bedroom or something, just, you know, one of those computers that are plugged into the wall and that's where you had all your social media and everything. Yeah. Uh, not you particularly, yeah, I don't yeah. know what your relationship with social media and your phone is. But in general, imagine if that's like we, we took it back to 2007. No one had a phone, barely anyone had a laptop. Yeah. You're very limited by it. You're mm. limited. Like, I have to sit on this chair. Yeah. I, I have remember. to right, log into Facebook, log into whatever it is to Instagram, log into TikTok. Mm. Eat, I've got things to do and it's all just on that computer. You would not be so addicted to it. Mm. And I just watch a lot of young children that I'm very worried about being completely addicted to their phones, as young as 11. And I have friends with kids, my, my kids are not 11 yet, but uh, you know, they're 11 immediately, they give them a phone. And they say, my child used to be interested in karate. My child used to draw beautiful paintings and now he or she just sits in a room all day. And I go to their houses and I say, where's your kid? This was, I remember it was in the summertime. So where's your kid? And the kid came down eventually after come down, you know, come down the stairs, say hello. And the kid was pale. So I said, yeah. well, he hasn't been in the sun at all during the summer? No, just on, just on the phone. Oh my word. It's tragic, but it's a lot of the time, this is the, the most tragic part of it is that we're doing it as adults because we want to be on our phone. Yeah. So we give them a phone so we can be on our phone. Wow. So I'm extremely mindful of how I'm on, the, how often I'm on the phone. Mm. I don't have any apps. The only app I have is Instagram because there is no other way to upload. I have no, no social media apps at all. Yeah. So I have to log in on a laptop. Yeah. And I just feel like it's really helped me in so many ways, like just to appreciate things around me. Definitely. And to, um, you know, we really are going to regret it in many years' time. We're going to look back. You know, when you have flashbacks, you think, oh, God, I'm just me looking at a phone. I don't, yeah. you know, it's, I, you look up from your phone. Definitely. So happens. And I, I don't want to sound um, judgmental to anyone. You know, I don't want to be that person. But I do think we need to be a lot more aware of it. I think it is changing now. People are starting to, I've noticed more people reading books on the bed. Yeah. Just yeah. making those little changes, doing crosswords and things like Definitely. that. Definitely. And, and breaking the addiction. Yeah, because that's what it is. And I don't, like, for instance, my my kids go, it's getting to that age, go, I want a smartphone. I said, you're not having a smartphone. I said, I'll get you a wise phone, mm. not a dumb phone, 
a wise phone, mm. which means the old fashioned phone. You can call me. Yeah. You, if, you can text your friends. You can take a photograph. It's no link to the internet. Wise phone. Yeah. The wise phone, we should start calling them, not the dumb phone. I like that. I really like that. And again, it goes one's back to- One's a smartphone, to, one's a wise phone. Exactly. And it's just that little change in terminology. Again, it changes everything, doesn't it? It changes the way we think about things. Like we were talking about earlier about being outcome dependent or goal orientated. Just two yeah. drastically different things. Tell me, let's talk as, uh, as, as, as we round off. Okay. Tell me about the academy. Okay. So- um, as well as running my seven day mastery program and my acceleration program, which helps men to improve their attraction rate, their success rate with women, um, they can work with me and I can provide straight away clients for them, my yeah. paying clients. And uh, if they say, well, actually I wanna do my own thing, they'll get my full support, in which, me which means that I will introduce them to my entire mailing list, which is over like 400,000. Yeah. Uh, my All my social media accounts, my YouTube channel, which is 400,000 also subscribers, wow. over 75 million views. Wow. So they'll get access to all those eyes. Love that. And um, yeah, we've already got, so we had one man, he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to work for me, which is fine, it's fine. He's because he's based in Germany. Mm. But he said, I want to open a boot camp under the Kezia Noble umbrella. So it's like a franchise. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. We can do that also. Um, mentor them. Um, a couple of them are writing an ebook, which is fantastic. And then Love that it. gets featured on my website. And nice. again, everybody on my mailing list, my social media accounts will hear about it. It'll be promoted that way. And where's the best place to go for anyone who's interested in exploring this? The best place to go is the website kezia-noble.com and there you will find the option to click on the Academy website. Kezia, it has been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I've learned a lot. And there is definitely a massive connection between seduction and marketing, as you've already highlighted, that I want to start exploring a lot more. What's one very last thing that you would love to share with the listeners that you feel that they just need to hear right now? Okay. Um, in terms of marketing business, yeah? Absolutely. Okay. Um, focus on your mailing list, okay? This is huge. A lot of entrepreneurs right now out there, big YouTube uh, followings, TikTok followings. You go on their about section, it takes you to an Instagram account. You go to their Instagram account, it takes you back to YouTube. They have no website even. It's you. The website is everything, the mailing list is everything because you can unfortunately in this day and age be canceled for all sorts of things, even things that you didn't think were yep. you know, offensive in any way, you can be canceled. The algorithm can completely go against you. You can be demonetized just like that. Yep. And we saw that over the pandemic, there was a lot of problems going on, freedom of expression. And a lot of people think, well, that's past, that was then, you, you don't know what's around the corner, something else that could restrict your account. Something yeah. you thought was perfectly innocent. Totally. So if I was canceled tomorrow, God forbid, and I lost all my social media channels, I would still have that mailing list. And those are the people you have to look after, is the mailing list. Uh, followers come and go. They get bored, someone else is more funny. What if you can't do a video? What if you're uninspired for a month? What if you need a break? They will, in this day and age, they will go to someone else and there will be someone waiting in the wings to take your place. Yeah. But the mailing list is when someone has really gone out of their way, they've signed up for something. Uh, it could be a, a, an ebook, a free gift. But I know for me, I you know, look at, I consume all sorts of things maybe. But when I actually go to the website, there's something changes then, something mm. changes. And when I sign up to something on the website, then I've made an investment. Definitely. There's some sort of investment. Anyone can click and follow somebody. So I would say to a lot of guys, yeah, I'm not saying, of course, concentrate on your social media, YouTube channels in particular, I find are the best for, you know, getting new clients. But don't, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, neglect. Neglect, thank mm. you. Don't neglect your, your email. Um, list and have an email list. That's what I've noticed. There's so many people they've got no mailing list, and I'm doesn't make any sense. If they're cancelled tomorrow, they've got nothing. It doesn't make any sense because that's like your tribe. They're your individuals. They're your people. On YouTube, she's doing really well. She also <coughs> teaches dating and stuff. She has millions of views. She's she's doing better than me. She has an Instagram account. 
She's not selling any product. That's another thing. It's like kind of like just making money from you have a product at the end Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Have something to sell. That's my uh, advice. Kezia, it has been an absolute pleasure. This has been one of my favorite interviews Thank and you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. Can I just leave this with a, a, a moment of appreciation? <laughs> something I've recognized about you is that you clearly are very, very passionate about what you do. Yeah. And not only because you've been doing it for a long time, but you talk about it with joy and you talk about it with insight and you talk about it with a sense of energy where it's so clear that you are the person that's supposed to be helping these men and you're supposed to be teaching them what you're teaching them. And I think the combination of that passion and that drive and that energy that you've got and the way in which you share it is a light for all of those men out there that think there is no hope here. There is a hope. And that hope is you, Kezia. So just thank you for that. I really thank appreciate you so much. it. Thank you for having me on. Anytime, anytime.